where do all the no goods come from? Well, of course, they come from the logic program and there will be a translation that takes a logic program and translates it into a set of no goods. And all this boils down to the everlasting question of what is a stable model? Not again, you may say, but well, this is more or less the ultimate uh, characterization of stable models and everything we did before, all the hard work in understanding the reduct, axioms, operators, will pay off now because we can more or less draw on all this. This paved the way for our characterization of stable model in terms of no goods. And once we have this, we are ready to go. Please keep in mind, once we have our set of no goods, we only need unit propagation and a search algorithm on top of it. Anyway, so what we, we do now is look at a characterization of stable models in terms of Boolean constraints or no goods. Indeed, we draw right upon on the axiomatic characterization of stable models to describe the no goods obtained from a logic program. And accordingly, we first look at the no goods obtained from completion formulas and then at the ones obtained from loop formulas. First of all, recall from the part on the axiomatic characterization that completion gives us a set of equivalences. It says that an atom is equivalent to the disjunction of all bodies of rules in which the atom appears at, as the head. So we are doing here exactly the same thing, just that we start to optimize a little bit. So here is more or less the skeleton of the completion formula that we are looking at. So first of all, the notation below. Here we simply collect all bodies of rules that have the atom A in the head. Okay, now that we have an atom and we say that B1 to BK are these bodies of the rules that contain A in the head, we write here the equivalence that corresponds to the completion formula, just that we introduce new auxiliary atoms, VB1 to VBK, that uh, stand for the actual bodies uh, of the rules. Now, given that we have introduced these guys, we also have to define them, so we have to add further equivalences that tell us actually what these variables mean or what they stand for. And that's pretty straightforward. So each of them is equivalent to the conjunction of the, of the original positive and negative body literals, right? So if this auxiliary variable abbreviates B, and B consists of these positive and negative body literals. This is the conjunction of these guys, and this guy holds if and only if the conjunction of them holds, right? So this is more or less the idea. So we also look at uh, completion formulas just in a bit, in a slightly transferred way that actually will help us to, 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 to capture all this right away in no goods, as we will see in a sec. Good. Before we do that, one little uh, notation thingy. So rather than actually using these uh, auxiliary variables, we will often just use, um, just use the body and write that the body is true or the body is false. And I will also talk about the body being true or the body being false. But under the hood, after all, uh, there is this auxiliary variable and these guys stand then for the truth or the fal falsity of these auxiliary variables. But I guess you agree. Two symbols are easier than three. Okay, now let's really work out now how we obtain the no goods from this uh, form of completion. More precisely, we'll be looking at both type of equivalences. Here the atom-oriented equivalences and here the body-oriented equivalences. So let's actually start with the second one, because after all, uh, this is just the encoding of a conjunction. So a variable is equivalent to a conjunction of literals. And then in turn, we do the atom-oriented one. So let's get going. So here it is again, what I call a body-oriented equivalence, which says that, well, a body is true if and only if the conjunction of all positive and negative body literals hold, right? Well, keep in mind that an equivalence like this is actually a bidirectional implication that runs from one side to the other and the other way around. And what we will do now is more or less we will decompose this equivalences into both uh, implications. So the first one we look at is this one, which says, oh, if the body is true, then all the body literals must hold. And in fact, this single implication can be decomposed into a conjunction of disjunction, a conjunction of clauses. 
right? Where each of them says, oh, either the body is false or the positive body literal is true, or either the body is false or the negative body literal is true. So perhaps this doesn't really uh, now catch, catch the eye on how this bridges to no goods, but actually we can double negate both of them with, with a, an application of the Morgan's law, right? So all of them are equivalent to saying it can't be the case that the body is true and a positive uh, body literal is false. Or it can't be the case that the body is true and actually a negative body literal is false because the underlying atom is true. And now that we see this, this is more or less can be, or this more or less cries out, uh, translate me to no goods, right? Because it's just the same condition that is now formulated in terms of no goods. Just repeating what I was saying, what do these no goods now say? They say, just as this guy, it can't be the case that the body is true, but a positive uh, body literal has been found to be false. Or it can't be the case that the body is true and the negative body literal has been found to be false, that is the underlying atom has been found out to be true. So this is uh, the equivalence in this direction. Let's now look at the other one. So here it is, the second uh, implication that goes the other way around. And this one now says uh, that whenever the, the positive and the negative body literals are true, or the conjunction actually of all of them is true, then the auxiliary variable representing the body must also be true. So as before, we can translate this into a disjunction. And in this case, we obtain actually a single one. So here it is, um, which is a straightforward uh, a a translation, of course, but what actually really makes this interesting if, if we apply again the trick of double negating the disjunction by applying the Morgan's law. So then what it says is the following. So it says that it cannot be the case that the conjunction of all the positive and the negative body literals is true and the body is false at the same time. Right? And again, this, is, uh, this already is, is directly what, what sh it should be expressed by a no good. And we can translate this and map this directly into the corresponding no good. Here it is. The only thing that I've done, I've actually moved the body variable to the front. And now what this no good says, it can't be the case that the body is false, but all of its body literals are true. And again, a positive body literal is true if the atom is true, and a negative one is true if the underlying atom is true. False. Okay, so this is now uh, the translation of the body-oriented equivalence into no goods. And we've seen that we get two different sets. Now let's actually look how this works with the atom-oriented equivalence. Okay, here it is, the atom-oriented equivalence saying that an atom is true if and only if one of the bodies of the rules that has this atom in the head has also become true. Just that here again, we don't talk about the bodies, but uh, auxiliary variables that serve as representatives for these guys. So also, I will not now develop uh, the corresponding no goods, the two sets that we get here from this equivalence, but perhaps let you pause this video and work it out yourself. So after all, the schema is the same. You take the equivalence, decompose it in two implications, then you do the logical transformation, you apply the Morgan's law, and in one case, for one implication, you get this set of no goods, and for the other one, you get this. So, well, enjoy doing the translation. I think it's, it's pretty straightforward. Anyway, so now that you have seen which no goods are obtained from the completion formula, let's see them in action, and let's look at some examples. So this time, let's start with the atom-oriented no-goods and observe them in action. Okay, so whenever we have an atom A that appears as the head of K rules whose bodies are B1 to BK, we get K plus 1 no-goods. Now the first one says it cannot be the case that the atom is true, but all rules that have this atom in the head are inapplicable because the respective bodies are all false. The other no goods say, well, it can't be the case that the atom is false, but one rule that has this atom in the head is actually applicable because its body is true. And there we have K of them. Okay, now this is the abstract uh, way we get actually uh, no goods from the atom 
oriented completion form or completion formula that is the equivalent as we've seen before. Let's now look at a more precise example. So here it is. We just look at two rules. Both of them has, have x in the head. Hence we associate with x the bodies in which y occurs and not z occurs. And this is exactly expressed by, by this uh, equation here, right? All the bodies in the program P of the rules that have x in the head are the body that contains y and the body that contains non-z. And accordingly, we get these three no-goods. Now again, the first one says it cannot be the case that x is true, but both bodies have been found to be false. And the other one says it cannot be the case that x is false, but the body of the first rule has been found to be applicable or has been found to be true. Or the second one says it cannot be that x is false, but the second rule could apply. Right? Because there the body has been found to be applicable. Okay, now with this example, let's actually see what type of inferences we can get. And for this, we simply pick one of the no goods, and I just picked uh, this first one with uh, three uh, literals, and we just observe the inferences we can get with this no good. Now, we take this no good, and what we start with is, is an assignment, right? And in this assignment, uh, both bodies have been found out to be false. This means actually all but one literal of our no good are in the current assignment. Hence, uh, we, we cannot actually see to adding this remaining literal and we can deduce its complement. So we can actually deduce from the fact that both bodies are false that also x must be false. Now let's look at this in the program. So if we found out that both bodies have been found out to be false, we can unipropagation gives us that x is false and this actually means none of the rules that could provide x apply, hence also x must be false. And this is now reflected by this type of unipropagation on the no good level. So second example. So again, same no good, just now we look at another uh, assignment. Here we look at the assignment where x actually is true, but the body of the first rule has been found to be false. So in this case, again, all but one literal of the no good uh, are in the assignment. Hence, we can derive the complement of the remaining one, which actually is this guy. Hence, we can derive that since, after all, x is true and the first rule is inapplicable, the second one must have uh, be responsible for the derivation of the atom, which makes perfect sense, right? Let's look at this on the program level. So here again, this is our situation. We, we for some reason, we, we, we assign x the value true and the body that contains y the value false. And this means actually that x is actually true, but this rule has been found to be applicable because this body has been found out to be false. Accordingly, the only chance to make x true is actually that this body here uh, is true. And this is actually what we derive. Yeah, I guess this shows nicely actually how the inferences on the program level are mirrored by uh, no good propagation, unit propagation on the no goods. Okay, now that we did this for the atom oriented no good, let's look at on how this works for body oriented no goods. Recall that the purpose of body-oriented no-goods is to link the truth value of the auxiliary variable representing the body with the actual body literals. So if we have a body that contains n body literals, we get n plus 1 no-goods. Now the first one says it cannot be the case that the body or the auxiliary variable representing the body is false, but all body literals have been found to be true. While the second bunch or the second type of no good says that it can't be the case that the body is true but a positive body literal has been found out to be false or it can't be the case that the body is true and the negative body literal has been found out to be false that is the underlying atom has been found out to be true. Now these are the no goods we get from this equivalence linking body literals with the auxiliary atom representing bodies. Again, let's see them in action, but not in that much detail as we did for the atom-oriented no-goods. After all, you also want to play around with them, right? 
So here's the example we are looking at. We are looking simply as a, at a body that has two literals, a positive body literal x and a negative body literal not y. And this body occurs in one or several rules in our program. Anyway, what we get are then three uh, no goods. So the first one says it can't be the case that the body is false, but all constituent body literals are true. And the second type of no good says it can't be the case that the body is true, but one of the body literals has been refuted is either if it's a positive one has been found out to be false or if it's a negative one, then the atom underneath has been found out to be true. So that's what we get. So as before, actually, I just pick now one of these uh, no goods to illustrate a bit how inferences on the program correspond to unit propagation on no goods. And as before, I pick the fat one, the one with three literals, this guy here. And we just look at different constellations, right? So in the first case, our assignment says, oh, uh, x is true and y is false. So this actually means that both constituent uh, atoms or literals in the body have been found out to be true. Hence, actually, by unit uh, propagation, we can also deduce that the body is true. Okay, here's another situation. Here the situation is, oh, the body has been found out to be false, but the positive body literal is true. Oh, hence the culprit must be the negative one. Well, here it is. We can deduce by unit propagation that y is true and hence that not y is false. So again, perhaps this in case you want to work through this a bit more carefully, just pause the video and uh, uh, a sheet of paper and a pencil perhaps and try to work this out in more detail. Okay, good. So now that we have seen all these no goods, are we sure that they really capture stable models or perhaps only a part of the stable models that is perhaps you remember? So we are only looking at uh, completion formulas, so perhaps we're not yet there. But let's see that on the next slide. Well, I guess that was too obvious, right? We've already seen that if we only take completion formulas, we only can capture supportive models and supportive models co coincide with stable models only on tight programs where we have no cycles uh, in the dependency graph. So in the same way here, if we put together all the types of no goods for the atom oriented and the body oriented equivalences, we get this set here, delta P. That's all the no goods we get from the completion uh, formulas. And then they allow us to capture tight logic programs. That is, a set of atoms is a stable model of a logic program, if and only if there is actually a unique solution for this set of no goods, such that the true atoms in this solution coincide exactly with x. So this is more or less the set of no-goods that we get from the completion formulas. Let, next, let's look at the no-goods we get from the loop formulas. 